So this should be hopefully an exciting and happy Sunday as we begin a new life of ministry together. A Sunday filled with joy and excitement and the scriptures from that exciting, happy book of Lamentations. <laughs> now, I, I was going to do the lectionary text from Matthew about a sower sowing some seeds and some different plants come up, and it's nice and happy. But I heard the youth were going on a mission trip last week. And I thought I'd love to be able to talk about why they chose to go on a mission trip, what they did there, and how that's instructive for the whole church, from the Old Testament to the New, even being led by our youth. Our New Testament lesson comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, verses 25 to 37. Mark writes, It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, ha, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Elwa, Elwa, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come and take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Let us pray. Come now, Lord, in power and come in might. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So it was my first trip to New York City. I'm from South Carolina in a small little, it's not too small, but you know, nothing like New York City. So I was 13, and my parents, my sister, and I we were going to New York. And I was so excited to see all the sights and sounds. I was going to go up on top of the Empire State Building. My dad and I were going to go see a baseball game. The Yankees play the Mariners. And I was going to see my absolute favorite pitcher pitch, a guy named Randy Johnson. Anybody remember Randy Johnson? sidearm? I had like 200 of his baseball cards. I still do. Why are you laughing? <laughs> we also went and saw a Broadway show, Phantom of the Opera. After the show, I got one of those little plastic half masks, and I ran around the hotel room saying, Sing for me, my angel of music! And my sister thought I was weird. <laughs> I thought the city was just so full of life and abundance and amazingness. One well, night, my dad and I went to the baseball game. My mom and my sister went to see another Broadway show, I think La Bamba, the Richie Valen story. My dad and I were on the subway in between one of those longer rides between two stops. This man in tattered clothes and a scruffy face stood up and said, I don't want to have to do this, but I have no other choice. He had his hand in his pocket, holding something that stretched the fabric of his coat. He said, I have no other choice. I need to do something that gets you to listen to me, to hear me, to see me. Even now, most of you aren't even paying attention to me. I have no other choice. My heart started beating faster. My stomach turned, and I feared the worst. In 587, 
the Babylonian army came down from the north towards Jerusalem and laid waste to that entire city. They put it under siege. They knocked down the walls and the temple. They took away many of the inhabitants, a time known as the Babylonian exile. But people were left in Jerusalem, and their pain is written down in this book we call Lamentations, a kind of funeral song for the city, where they kind of say, does it matter to no one that we're in such pain? We've lost so much. We've lost our homes, our place of worship, our friends. And people were coming in and stealing from the leftover ruins. While the people in Jerusalem reached out their hands, could you help us? And those people came by, they reached out their hand right past those outstretched hands to grab what they could and walk away. What's recorded, they would say, is all who pass your way clap their hands at you. They scoff and shake their head at the daughter of Jerusalem in this sarcastic clap, like, ha, you got what was coming to you. Look at you now. And the inhabitants of the city, they wept. And there's this line repeated throughout the book that says, there is none to comfort. There is none to comfort. There is none to comfort. The poet asks, is it nothing to you, all of you who pass by? Is it nothing to you who pass by? It's not enough that the city of defense now lies in ruin. Is it not enough the city of joy now laments? Is it not enough the city full of people is now empty? Is it not enough the city of God's pleasure seems to receive God's wrath? Is it not enough that Zion suffers, that she must suffer alone? Is it nothing to you who pass by? The man on the subway was shouting through his tears. He pulled his hand out of his coat pocket. And you ever have that experience where your heart just stops? It seems like forever. It's only a split second, but it seems like time to stand still in between a heartbeat. And he pulled out his hand, and he held a banana. And he began to tell us this was all he was going to eat today. And if I'm honest, I kind of stopped listening after that. The threat was gone, and my stop was coming up. I passed him on my way out of the subway to enjoy a baseball game and watching the Yankees lose, which is always fun. <laughs> Sorry to Yankees fans, you had it coming. And if I had been really listening, I would have heard the ancient lament in his words. Is it nothing to you, all who pass by on these trains, day by day, to work, to play, to sightsee? Is my hunger, my pain, my plight, my despair, is it nothing to you? Apparently not. I passed on by. Almost 500 years after the fall of Jerusalem and this song of lament recorded in Lamentations, outside the same city called Golgotha was this hill there. The same question could have been asked right there on Golgotha. Crucifixion was a horrible way to die. That's why the Romans used it so much. It was meant to be a symbol of Roman power and superiority, a constant threat to anyone who might stand up against the might of Rome. Crucifixion wasn't just death. It was humiliation and prolonged suffering. Jesus was crucified. He wasn't alone, but he was alone. They were two crucified with him, but in Mark's account, they both jeer at Jesus, make fun of him. There's no repentant thief who Jesus promises paradise to in Mark's gospel. There's no mother of Jesus and disciple whom Jesus loved there at the foot of the cross that Jesus can look fondly at. Soldiers were there, and priests were there, and of course the crowd, that crowd that was yelling, crucify, crucify. There were plenty of witnesses, but they were there for the spectacle, not for Jesus. 
they join the priests and the soldiers in mocking Jesus. Instead of water, they give him vinegar. Instead of prayers, they issue curses. Instead of praise, they offer derision. Instead of walking by in holy awe, they strut by with furrowed brows and clenched fists. And they laugh and they mock with sarcasm. He can save others, why can't he save himself if he's so great? They joke, he's calling for Elijah. Let's all see if he comes down to save him. Spoiler alert, I'm guessing he won't. They were making fun of him. Or they just pass by, like the disciples who run away, not even giving a second thought. In Mark's gospel, no one stands by Jesus. No one stands with Jesus. No one stands for Jesus. Despite the overabundance of human attention, there is a vacuum of human comfort. Jesus wasn't alone, but he was alone. Perhaps you know that feeling. You're surrounded by so many people, but they don't understand your pain. Or maybe they do know of it, but they don't want to mention it to you. Maybe they're nervous or scared. You're surrounded by people and yet you feel utterly alone. Have you been there? Jesus was there. There's none to comfort. There's none to comfort. And if this ancient Hebrew poet of Lamentations would have been there at the foot of the cross, surely he would have raised his voice once again in passionate protest. Is it nothing to you, all who pass by, is it nothing to you lepers whose hands he's cleansed that his hands are now torn and bleeding? Is it nothing to you whose eyes he washed, whose sight he returned, that now his eyes are matted and blurred by the stream of red that flows from his forehead and brow? Is it nothing to you whose thirst he quenched with miraculous wine that now his only drink is vinegar? Is it nothing to you whose ears and hearts were blessed with his lofty words that now he hears only the doubter's curse? Is it nothing to you that he who was a comforter of all suffers in a void of any comfort whatsoever? Is it nothing to you who pass by? See, I thought the city was all life and success and prosperity and wealth. But I learned it wasn't. On the subway ride, walking to the stadium, seeing the people on the street with their signs, seeing the homeless and the desperate. After the game, we took the wrong subway. I blame my father. We got out and we walked up and it was dark and we were in the middle of a place called Harlem. I didn't know much about Harlem except I'd heard the word and I knew I was supposed to be scared. And so we ran back down and tried to get back to you know, the nice part of the city. I didn't want to be in the city anymore. Sometimes I wonder if we treat what we call the inner city like the ancient ruins of Jerusalem. Do we avoid it at all costs unless we want to somehow plunder what we can from it? I recently went to Facebook and to ask people what they thought of when they heard the words inner city, because when you want feedback, you go to Facebook, and you'll get it whether you ask for it or not, so I thought I might as well ask for it. So these are some of the answers people said. Bad schools. Ghetto high crime, drugs, substandard housing, low income. One woman wrote, we are taught to believe that the inner city is low income, high crime, gangs, lots of guns and drugs, run down housing and government housing, unsupervised children, predominantly minorities. An older white man replied, when I hear inner city, it's a phrase white people use to describe a part of town they are distanced from. I've never heard people who live there describe it that way. Interesting. A young woman said, it seems that we're taught that there's an intentional negative stigma to the term inner city. But we also recognize there are some real issues, challenges, inequalities there. We know there are problems there, but we have the luxury of looking the other way. In other words, we pass by. I'll confess right now I'm guilty of that. I've heard the cries from Flint, Michigan. Is it nothing to you who pass by that we don't have clean water to drink? 
but I don't really hear it. Because what have I done about it? How have I acknowledged their cry? Sure, I sent a case of water when it was all over the news two years ago so I could pat myself on the back. But let's be honest. I passed by. It's asked by the youth of Chicago, is it nothing to you who pass by that we are more likely to be shot or imprisoned than graduate high school? It's asked by the men and women on the streets of Philadelphia or Harrisburg or any other city in the U.S., is it nothing to you that we have no place to live? Nothing to eat, no money to our name. Is it nothing to you because you assume it's our own fault? As in the days of the ancient poet of Jerusalem, so now the question either goes unheard or, or, or unanswered. Is it nothing to you who pass by? I can only imagine their own response to the silence. There is none to comfort. There is none to comfort. A number of our youth just returned from a week-long mission trip to Philadelphia. They chose to go there. It was a situation where they were forced, like sometimes when I was a kid, I felt forced to go to church, and I'd try everything I could do to get out of it. You know the old thermometer on the light bulb trick? Ever used that? The key is you have to take it off quickly, or it shows you're like 120 degrees and you should be dead, and then your mom knows you're not really sick. Kids don't do that. That's wrong. They wanted to go, though. So I asked them, well, why did you choose to go? Why did you choose to enter the city of lament and see the pain, to hear the struggle, and to do something about it? One of the youth said, well, I chose to go on the mission trip to get a different view of life and to help people in need. I look forward to helping people out and growing more in this experience. Another said, the idea of diving into a completely different lifestyle and the opportunity to hear stories and help others as well as spread the word of God. Another said, I wanted to go out and, and help people and, and try to improve their lives. They chose this because they wanted to help and to reach out, to be with and comfort those who they will probably never see again. But they believe in the family of God that they are their brother and their sister's keeper. You'll get to hear later this morning about their experiences in Philadelphia, what they saw, what they heard, what they did, what they learned. They didn't solve every problem in Philadelphia. They didn't meet every need of every person they met. No one expected them to do that. But I'm willing to bet the people they met were thankful for their presence were in some way comforted and didn't walk away from meeting these youths asking, is it nothing to you? Or crying out, there's none to comfort. Because you were there. I hope and pray this is true for anyone who has contact with Dairy Presbyterian Church. For anyone in this community, our goal as a church of Jesus Christ should be to let people know that they matter. Dairy does a lot of good things to help others here and around the world. There's all you did last month during Mission Week. There's your crop walk, your work with Camp Chrislin, the financial impact you make on local missions and ministries through the Presbytery and the city around the world. There's the way you are intentional about small things like taking Sunday morning's flowers to people who could use just a bit of beauty in their lives. Those big things and those little things, they help people know they matter, that they're seen, that they aren't alone, that their lives are something to us. The reality is, though, that despite your generous mission giving, your hands on missions, your good intentions, we will not be able to fix every problem or meet every need. We have no delusions about our capabilities. We can't just fix people's lives like that. There are some things we simply can't make happen, at least not in our own time. Moreover, we know that we cannot mend or, or fix your broken dreams, or will rekindle your dying hopes at the drop of a hat. We would not be so foolish as to have you pretend that the gnawing agony in the depths of your innermost being does not exist, though. For we know that healing can only come when we affirm the reality of the affliction. We want people to know it's okay to be sad, and to be hurt, and to be scared. 
We are called to offer comfort and compassion so that everyone who surrounds this church will know they are something to God. They are something to us. They are brothers and sisters, children of God, beloved and precious in God's sight. Whatever their pain or trial or challenge, it is something to us. We will stand by and stand up for whoever is in need. I hope when people think of this church, they don't immediately think of the building or the history or the music, but they think of the care and the compassion and the love. Yes, it is something to us, we who pass by. It is something to us that you suffer. We will name that suffering, not minimize it or ignore it or trivialize it or relativize it. You will not be so presumptuous, though, to say that we suffer with you, for we cannot fully know what it is you suffer. Yet we would say that while you suffer, you do not suffer alone. We may not be able to suffer with you, but we can be with you while you suffer. And that is where we choose to be. That is what we choose to do. Because it is something to God. It is something to us. I told the children that simple phrase. You'll hear it a lot. God is with us, and God is for us. No matter what happens in your life, no matter what you've done, or what you are experiencing, that's true. And it's also true for your neighbor. No matter who they are, or what they've done, God is with them and for them. And because we know that truth, we live that truth, we celebrate that truth that gives us hope and strength, we can be that for other people. It can be something to us. Dairy Presbyterian Church can be with them and for them. I hope together we can make sure everyone in this area knows that no matter what, We are with them, and we are for them, with God's love. Because we love the Lord our God with all our heart, and all our soul, and all our mind, and all our strength. And we love our neighbor as ourselves. And we can simply tell them, that means you. You're something to me, and you're something to God. How can I help? How can I help? Let us pray together. Almighty God, we thank you that you are a God who is with us and for us. That even in times of trial and tribulation and lamentation, Lord, we are not alone. We are thankful for this church family who walks with us, even in the valley of the shadow of death. That they often act as your rod and your staff and they comfort us. Lord, help us to be your comfort and your consolation to all who we meet so they know it is something to us. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.